Today I am preaching the fifth in a sermon series on the book of Job that Bill and I are discussing this fall about a faithful man from the land of Uz who loses everything. And in the midst of Job's story of deep grief and loss, we meet a parade of characters. Last week we meet his friends who managed to do just the right thing, sit quietly before they open their mouths and blow it. For chapter after chapter, they offer their hurtful encouragements and damaging theology. But God bless Job, even as he sits on the ash heap of what was once his prosperous life, he musters the energy to push back a little bit against his friends, and he cries out with what you might call a broken hallelujah, praising God and also lamenting his undeserved fate. He demands to have his day in court with God. And it is at this point we meet today's character, Elihu, a young man who, depending on your perspective, is either full of hot air or a breath of fresh air. I'm going to read from the message translation today because it sounds closest to what I imagine Elihu's voice sounds like as he interjects into this argument. But let me tell you, Job, you are wrong, dead wrong. God is far greater than any human, so how dare you haul him into court and then complain that he won't answer your charges. God always answers one way or another, even when we don't recognize God's presence in a dream, for instance, or a vision at night, or God might even get their attention through pain by throwing them on a bed of suffering. They hang on the cliff edge of death, knowing their next breath might be their last. But even then, an angel could come, a champion. There are thousands of them to take up your cause, a messenger who will mercifully intervene, canceling the death sentence with words. I've come up with the ransom, and before you know it, you're healed. The very picture of health, this is the way God works over and over again, pulling our souls back from the depths of certain destruction so we'll see the light, so we will live in the light. Keep listening, Job, Elihu says. Don't interrupt, I'm not finished yet, but if you think of anything I should know, tell me there is nothing I would like better than to have your name cleared. Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In a series of short videos, Kate Bowler, who is a stage four cancer survivor and an author, offers her thoughts on a jar full of sayings often offered to people who are facing grave illness. Can I give you a hug? May I bring you a meal this week? Have you watched The Bachelorette? These remarks all receive high marks from Kate Bowler. But other well-meaning sentiments don't fare so well. She saves her harshest critique for the platitude, Everything Happens for a Reason, which also happens to be the title of her first memoir. Reasons, she says, are weapons. And she says this while she also unpacks this idea that humans are wired to find a cause for suffering and evil. Bowler describes it as a spiritual boomerang. We try to find out the reason because then, ta-da, we will solve the problem. And so we approach Elihu today with empathy and skepticism. There's nothing he wants more than to clear Job's name now emboldened by his certainty and this frustration that has grown into anger as he's listened to these other friends drone on and on and on. He spends five chapters telling us that he is right. Can you just imagine Job holding on to faith by his fingertips while this know-it-all keeps on talking? In this sermon series, we've been asking hard questions about suffering and evil. And so I've been using this interesting book I found by Bethany Solarator called Why Is There Suffering? Pick Your Own Theological Adventure. It helps untangle some of these arguments. Each chapter starts with a question and then ends with a set of decisions. So for example, chapter one, what is God like? 
If God exists, or sorry, if God is good, go on to chapter 2. If God exists but doesn't love us, you might want to go to page 36. And if you want to explore the idea that God might not exist at all, go to page 41. It's a strangely effective way to write a book on suffering because instead of offering one right answer or that spiritual boomerang, the book's format reveals that suffering is a messy mystery and it's one that each of us must unravel for ourselves. She's created a map of sorts, and if you don't buy the reason for suffering, suffering that you arrive at, you can retrace your steps and try another route. So I used Elihu's speech to try and trace his thinking, and it led me to chapter 24 of Solarator's book, God Uses Suffering to Teach Us Lessons. Our souls, she says, are exercised by suffering, like our bodies are exercised on a treadmill or with weights. It's not pleasant, but it's necessary, she says. And Elihu says that there are ways that God teaches us, that God's wisdom is revealed. God might come in dreams. God might throw us on a bed of suffering. Or God could bring us a friend like Elihu to tell us that we're dead wrong. People have strong feelings about Elihu's thinking. You either, like Calvin and Aquinas, agree that suffering as a divine teaching tool um, it makes a lot of sense and is a logical way for God, the God of love, to teach us humans how to be better humans. Or you might be wary of this line of thinking because it sounds a lot like a spare the rod and spoil the child approach, which has been used to justify a lot of abuse in the world. I'm in the wary camp, along with the proponents of positive parenting and the pediatricians. The American Academy of Pediatrics says that they take a firm stance against aversive strategies, including corporal punishment and yelling at children and shaming them, because these strategies are not effective in the long term, and in fact, they lead to negative outcomes for children later on in life. So science tells us Punitive suffering is not a good teacher. So what are we to do with this text? Wise people in my life are fond of pointing out that two things can be true at the same time. It can be true that suffering is not the will or intentional teaching tool of a loving and merciful God who desires the flourishing of creation. And... It can also be true that people often do look back at their suffering and see that they have learned through their pain. Another growth opportunity, you might say, when you've gotten through the worst of it. So Elihu, he's mostly wrong, but not entirely wrong. What I think Elihu gets right is the need for God's gift of friendship. Not the friend who's going to tell you how wrong you are, but a one-in-a-million friend, an angel, that advocate, who will intervene on your behalf to save you from the depths, who brings you back from the brink. Do you have that friend who believes in you no matter what and will stand by you no matter what? Anthony Graves spent 18 years in jail, 12 of them on death row in a Texas prison. This was because of a wrongful conviction, and in fact, the case was so mishandled that the prosecutor was later disbarred. Graves remembers friends and loved ones who helped him to survive these years of inhumane conditions, fellow death row inmates who passed him books or packages of ramen noodles, pen pals from around the world who offered words of comfort and brought publicity to his case, and an attorney. Nicole Cazares, who believed in his innocence and fought for his eventual release. If it hadn't been for her, Graves says, I would not be breathing today. So now Graves is a friend to others, for people who need someone to believe in them. Through his foundation, he helps other wrongfully convicted people find good legal representation. He's established a re-entry program for people returning from incarceration, and he's created a speaker's bureau for people to tell their stories of the criminal justice system. A rare friend who believes in your story when no one else does can make all the difference. Recently, 
I spoke with someone whose views were becoming more and more inclusive and welcoming, especially around church and who is invited to the communion table. So I couldn't help but ask how this drastic change of heart and mind had occurred, so I asked them, and they said, it's simple, really. I just believe people's stories. When they tell me who they are, I believe them. When they tell me they've experienced racism or homophobia, I believe them. Step one in becoming an advocate, believe people's stories of suffering. Step two, keep showing up. Kate Bowler or Anthony Graves or Job or anyone whose suffering has no definite cause will tell you that a friend who arrives with a letter or a casserole or a listening ear or a hug will keep you breathing through the hardest times. You've seen pictures of the folks in the Carolinas and Florida showing up for each other in the chaos of the hurricane. Amidst so much loss, friends and neighbors know that coming by to save a cat or offer a ride on your jet ski through a flooded street or salvaging the treasured items from the house is much better, far better, than any boat full of empty platitudes. And these one in a million friends, they will keep showing up even after the headlines have moved on. God can be this friend too, yes? The challenge of the book of Job is that it starts with the scene where God and the adversary make a deal, and so we're forced to decide if this is really how we imagine God, or it's an imperfect literary device to get us into the story. But here in Elihu's speech, we find familiar words for God, advocate, messenger, champion, the one who pulls us back from the brink over and over again. Kate Bowler's second memoir, after she has fought cancer, says, is titled, There's No Cure for Being Human and Other Truths I Need to Hear. With the wisdom gained from going through the storm and back, she says, someday we won't need hope. Someday we won't need courage. Time itself will be wrapped in a bow, and God will draw us all into the eternal moment when there will be no more suffering, no more disease, and no more email. Until then, we are stuck with our beautiful, terrible finitude. Our lives are not problems to be solved. We can have meaning and beauty and love, but nothing even close to resolution. This is the mystery. Multiple things can be true. God is good. Suffering is real. It might teach us something. It might not. But a good friend who believes in us, who loves us, who shows up no matter what, will make all the difference. May we know that friend. May we be that friend. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.